William Pope, a January 6th defendant, is fighting for this discovery. Tucker Carlson is going to be getting his hands on 41,000 hours of footage, but criminal defendants like William Pope have been fighting for these hours of video for a very long time, and there's been a battle going on in the court of law. So today we're going to go through a written response by William Pope, and my understanding is, is he doesn't have counsel, so he drafted this response himself, and he filed it demanding that the government, who has control of all of the evidence, gives him the discovery so he can start going through it. Now, previously, this was kind of a long shot because the DOJ had been making the point that it's all highly sensitive. But if Tucker Carlson is going to be given access to 41,000 hours, is it really still highly sensitive? It's, you know, the cat's kind of out of the bag at this point. So maybe William Pope is able to actually get this, and maybe the judge will listen to some arguments based on the fact that this evidence is now out there. Okay, previously the judge would say, well, you can't just access anything you want and come up with weird, bizarre stories and uh, you know, give you this opportunity to go out on a fishing expedition, but that's not happening here because the evidence is about to be released publicly and all J6 defendants, according to Kevin McCarthy and Tucker and Marjorie Taylor Greene, they're going to get access to this stuff too. So in fact, this motion is is likely going to be moot at some point regardless. But my question is, what are the judges going to do with this newfound evidence? Are they going to honor arguments about Ray Epps? Are they going to honor arguments about collusion or conspiracies uh, that, that show that there were a, a number of undercover feds that maybe aren't conspiracies, right? It was a conspiracy until you look at the videos, you assemble it and you say, that's well, not actually a conspiracy anymore. Fed, 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 protester. If it's that situation, well, is a judge going to listen to those things? Let's get a quick summary over from the Epoch Times that did some good reporting and summation on this. You see, this story was drafted by Joseph Hanneman, posted February 18th from our friends at the Epoch Times. And he says, three undercover Metro police officers joined the march of protesters up the northwest side of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th including one who climbed over a barricade and pushed others toward the Capitol and another who walked behind Ashley Babbitt and predicted that someone will get shot. This came out from a newly disclosed court document filed by William Pope of Topeka, Kansas. We're going to read through those documents in a quick second. This also shows that MPD bicycle officers stopped four armed men in plain clothes, the video that we watched in a prior segment, and those men turned out to be federal agents. Video included with Pope's filings show that uniformed officers were, quote, set up to fail on January 6th. So we're going to go through those filings. Let's take a look at both of those. This is William Pope. He is the individual who has been charged with crimes for January 6th activities. And the court docket is out of the D.C. Circuit Court. You see it is United States versus Pope, case ending in 128. And as we look at the most recent filings, I want to show you just a couple things that have happened. So first and foremost, this case has actually been pretty quiet for a little bit of time. The last minute entry uh, prior to the one I want to show you is on December 2nd. They set another court date, February 3rd. We had a notice of appearance, so the government got a new prosecutor involved in this case. There was a motion to modify the protective order. Okay, so we're going to skip over this filing. This was filed by William Pope. Remember, the, there's a protective order that the DOJ has issued. Think of it like a force field that they put up all over and around the Capitol Hill surveillance footage. You can't get access to this stuff. Protective order, activate, one of those things. So it goes up. So th in this case, the defendant, William Pope, is asking the court to modify that. He's saying, I need all of that footage. I need those 41,000 hours to show you that the FBI was conducting the Fed surrection or whatever his argument would be. So he says, can we please modify this? Now, there was a minute entry that took place. We have this calendared for a March 3rd status conference, which is going to be March 3rd status conference. So in about two weeks from now, we'll have another court date. But there were additional filings. So Pope says, modify the protective order. The government responded right here on February 10th. We're going to read through that one relatively quickly. The government says, no, no, no. We need the protective order. We need this to stay in place. 
And Pope responded on February 17th, and we're going to read this one as well. This is his response to the government. So he says, modify it. The government says, no, don't. And he gets the final word in his reply, which we will read. So now that we are up to speed, we're caught up on the docket. Let's dive right in. So the government here is responding to Pope's request for discovery. In this case, it is about the modification of the protective order. So the government responds and they say, on February 10th, eight pages long, out of the District of Columbia court, prosecutors say, all right, the United States comes through our lawyer and we respectfully submit this response to pro se defendant William Pope, meaning he doesn't have a lawyer. He fired his other lawyer or asked for a withdrawal or something happened and he's going pro se at the moment. William Pope is asking, according to the government, they say, he wants unfettered and unsupervised access to global discovery contained in relativity and evidence.com, which are sort of these sort of like cloud data centers where all of this discovery lives. The government has previously responded to Pope's motion which was filed and incorporated before. They say now Pope argued that among other things that the government is complaining about giving access. And they say the court heard oral argument on these motions and took it under advisement. So meaning they're going to wait and see. So then Pope filed another update for some travel arrangements. And the government, this is actually a lot less interesting than I thought. All right, so we're going to fast forward through this. Here you go. Now we're talking about discovery. So the government says, look, Pope doesn't need this stuff. All right. First of all, they say no other defendant or including any other pro se defendant has gotten all of the access to all of the files, all of the surveillance, all of the hours. They're not giving it to anybody. On February 7th, Judge Maida said in another case that the defendant has no constitutional right to global discovery. And so think about this in a, a close analogy in this is like a DUI case. Let's say you're charged with a DUI and they draw your blood out and they draw two samples. So in Arizona, you get uh, the, the government gets one sample. The defense gets a sample if they want it. Now, let's say we go in there and we say, all right, look. We have questions about how you tested our client's blood. And we have questions about how you test the blood in general. And so we want evidence about not only the testing of our client's run and the way they test your DUIs uh, for DUIs is they take your blood, put it in like this big pizza tray and the big pizza tray has like 110 vials in it and a machine just picks them up, tests them, pokes them, tests them, pokes them, tests them, puts them back. So you say, I want to challenge my run. I want to challenge my pizza tray. You know, okay. Uh, well, maybe you can get that evidence, but you say, but I think it's bigger than that. I think it's all of the testing and all of the pizza trays and all of the DUIs and all of the machines, because I think you're using a wrong um, calibrator, right? It, across your whole lab. And I want records for everything to, te to test your calibrations and how you're formulating your standards. And I want all of the evidence. Well, the court's going to say, well, you don't need all of that stuff. Okay. You just need your run. And if you find a problem in your run, let me figure out the other stuff. And then you can expand out to go get the other pizza trays and all of the other runs. Same thing here. So the court is saying, well, you don't, if you can't figure out what the problem is with your individual case and all of this surveillance footage, I'm not going to give you access to 41,000 hours because then I got to give access to 41,000 hours to every other defendant, just like every other defendant in a DUI case would suddenly get access to, you know, every other run and it would really slow down the system truth, truthfully. So the, it, it's almost an efficiency thing, right? They just say, well, yeah, you might, it, it might be a good point for you to get this stuff so that you can make good legal arguments, but we don't care about any of that. Sorry. We're just going to say for efficiency, you don't have a constitutional right to it. So they say, that moreover, the D.C. Circuit Court, consistent with other courts, has previously affirmed cases that has limited discovery. In another case, in Clark, standby counsel was retained. And so here you could get Mr. Pope uh, four to eight hours of access per week, and that could alleviate his travel requirements. And so they're saying, look, the fact that he can't pay to come here and look at all this stuff, and it's not our problem, right? He's on his own. 
Here's what you can do, Judge. In this case, they say the balancing of interests requires that Pope and his request for unfettered access to sensitive and highly sensitive material be denied, right? A criminal defendant in America wants access to evidence, in this case, the surveillance footage, because we, we have a sneaking suspicion that the feds were not being honest with us, that what they told us happened here, and this was all just this like rambunctious, riotous, uh, insurrectionist group of people that overwhelmed all of our 23 federal agencies that were there, you know, is ridiculous. So maybe we have a little bit of, a, of an inkling that we want to investigate something else. They say denied. Sorry, it's too highly sensitive for you guys. Yeah. It's just surveillance footage. That's all. They, the government says, as this court has already recognized, and it's true because we're playing in a system in the D.C. circuit where this is the worst thing that has ever happened ever, you know, January 6th. Uh, I think Joe Biden even said it was the worst thing since the Civil War, which I think means he forgot about Pearl Harbor or he didn't forget about Pearl Harbor, which is probably worse. So as this court has already recognized, the protective order as it stands is needed to adequately protect the government's legitimate interests. Yeah, in not showing you all of their undercover feds. Specifically, the government has established good cause that the restrictions on access to sensitive and highly sensitive materials are needed to protect significant national security, right? law enforcement, and other governmental interests. Moreover, the government and the defense have both provided adequate solutions that allow Pope access to all discovery in this case without stepping and sidestepping the parameters of the protective order. For these reasons, they say Pope and his motion should be denied and discovery should be addressed in other ways. Signed by Kelly Moran. I'm going to uh, Kelly Moran, I think. Kelly Moran. Moran is here. Uh, Kelly Moran is uh, in the house. Matthew Graves, the U.S. attorney, signed on the document as well. So this is the filing. This is the government's filing to stop Pope from getting access to all of the rest of the Capitol Hill footage. Now, Pope gets the final word in these requests. And so he submitted his response here. William Alexander Pope files a 19 page response to the government's continued opposition to modify the protective order had to compel full access to discovery. Now, as I mentioned, William Alexander Pope is writing this pro per. Okay. So he's representing himself at this moment, which is interesting that he's doing that. And so that sort of, you know, offers an opportunity to say what you want in some respect. Let's see how this goes. So William Pope writes, as this court will recall, I have been trying to gain full access to discovery from the very moment I began representing myself. When the government opposed full discovery access, Judge Contreras instructed each party to attempt to find a solution and if it could not be resolved to bring the matter back to him. After discussions with the government, it became clear they were not willing to voluntarily grant the full discovery access needed to examine the evidence and prepare my defense, so I filed my motion to modify the protective order. He says, since then, the government has sought to blame the discovery access challenges I face on my decision to exercise my constitutional right to represent myself. However, as noted in my previous filing, the federal rules of evidence require the courts must ensure that pro se defendants have access to discovery. It is the duty of the government to provide me full access, and it is the duty of this court to ensure the government has provided that access to me. So these challenges that I face are not of my creation, but are of the government's creation. I merely am asking the court to compel the government to provide what should have already been provided voluntarily. Withholding all access to discovery violates the rules of evidence and denies me due process. And I couldn't agree more. And I mean that genuinely, this is excellent, right? I agree this is a due process violation. It's a discovery violation. If you can't see the evidence, and one of the key defenses is that there wasn't a global insurrection that was sort of the pretext for all of these crimes, that's a pretty good defense. And it is not afforded when you're not provided access. And this is directly explaining that. And I think this is brilliant because what he's doing is he is using his 
status as a pro se defendant to say that that gives him additional rights. He's saying, judge, I'm a pro se defendant. The rules require that you give me this stuff. If he didn't have, if he wasn't pro se, he wouldn't be able to latch onto this rule. And then his attorney would file a motion that wouldn't be able to use that rule. And then his attorneys would get rejected. So the attorneys would then be stuffed. They would say, oh, they'd have to go back to Mr. Pope and say, well, the judge denied my request for your global discovery. So you see here by actually not having an attorney, Mr. Pope has found himself a new argument. He continues, and it is not for the government to determine what is relevant to my defense. Only I can do that. The government has also made relevant evidence much more difficult for me because they have not identified every CCTV and body worn camera that is directly relevant to my case. This has forced me to search for that information myself. And the government will often do this. They'll just dump a big wheelbarrow or dump truck full of files and folders on your front lawn and they'll say, good luck. Hopefully you find what you need in there. The government, says Mr. Pope, also argued that the global discovery is not relevant to my case. That's what a Fed would say. Yet I have already shown the court clear examples of exculpatory evidence in the global discovery that the government failed to provide directly to me. Neither of the court-appointed attorneys that represented me identified those materials, nor did the standby counsel. It was my own keen attention to detail that recognized those materials as relevant to my case. He's blasting his prior lawyers. And as this court knows, writes Pope, the government has been showing exhibits at every January 6th trial from various times and places containing clips where the defendants on trial are not present. Because of that, I must study how scenes unfolded in times and places where I too was not present so that I may counter non-factual exhibits presented by the government in court. The government's use of unrelated low-level opinions to build a wobbly house of cards opposition does not supersede our Sixth Amendment rights, the federal rules of evidence, or any of the other rules under the United States Supreme Court. Individual rights must not be sacrificed in court to satisfy the whims of the government. Beautiful. So now he continues, and he writes, In an 11th hour attempt to prevent me from having full access to the, the discovery, the government has proposed having a third party investigator review my discovery for me. The government is basing this proposal taken on action in another case. He says, I'm concerned that an investigator would be an interference in my defense, just as government counsel is now. The government also made this proposal to the court without even knowing if there was anyone even in Topeka who would be willing to do this. So why did the government not explore this idea during the two months the court provided to investigate the options? But even if there is somebody in Topeka, he says, I wouldn't want them anyways. They're not going to do the research that I can do myself. So I don't want any barriers or burdens to detriment my defense preparations. He says the government put forward a Jim Crow proposal, he says. The government wishes this court to force me to expend my time and my monetary resources to access my discovery in Lawrence, Kansas. They want him to travel there. He says, as I told you previously, this option will be very expensive for me and essentially a tax on due process rights by forcing me to travel and give up my time and take off time off work and go and you know get in the car. And gas is expensive and all this. The process is in many ways the penalty. And he says the Supreme Court has said in other things that discovery and due process rights are fundamental and that any Im impediments to that are an attack on civil rights. Now, here's where he's talking about this CCTV camera. He says, since the government has allowed me to, quote, create still images from highly sensitive CCTV, 
They are essentially conceding that they're not concerned with the defendants possessing the files that identify the location and the positioning of those cameras. Great point. The government says, look, we're not going to give you all the files everywhere, but we're going to give you some access to some of the files and you can just basically export them frame by frame and recreate them. He says, that means that I can see everything. This is ironic since the location and position of cameras have been a significant part of their argument from giving me access to those. And now I do. He says, now I can be able to identify where all the cameras are in the Capitol building. He says, and the, mov and the movements of individuals that took place two years ago do not constitute a national security threat. He's giving us an example of, an, of a flip book here. Showing how you can take pictures, separate the slides, and create a flip book. So he says that basically not giving him access is ridiculous because you can just take pictures and create a flip book of this stuff and recreate <laughs> the videos. He says, now as this court will recall, the government presented a sworn affidavit by the biased DBAs in a previous filing. And they said that if they gave access to all the files, then they could recreate a layout of the Capitol. So the U.S. Capitol Police say a certain amount of this is national security, it's security information. They say the government is concerned about some of this stuff, but not all of it. He goes, he says, for instance, body camera footage from Officer Foskett shows him walking into the Senate at a certain time. This area has been identified by the government as relevant to my case, but the government prohibits me from possessing the CCTV footage of this area because it's, quote, highly sensitive. However, Officer Foskett's body camera footage is not designated as sensitive or highly sensitive, and because of that, the protective order specifies that it is not subject to this court seal. No logic to this. I should get access to that file. Why wouldn't it? In the September 2021 Media Law Resource Newsletter, it was noted that there were some very uh, egregious problems with the government not giving access. And here's another good section. William Pope writes, The government seems to be, and I think this is true, opposing discovery access to conceal their own activity. Ooh. He says, since the government has gone to great lengths to keep me from accessing my discovery, the court should consider whether the government is doing so to conceal their own activity. From the moment I decided to represent myself, the government has continuously tried to suggest to this court that I will bring an entrapment defense. They've discouraged me from representing myself. They've tried to prevent me from mounting an entrapment defense, and they're trying to prevent me from getting access to discovery. He says, I emphasize my position on direct and full access to discovery and that I'm guaranteed right to these rules by the rules of evidence. And he's talking about his lawyers. About bringing up entrapment and some other things. He's sharing some emails. He says, however... In my previous work as an auditor for the state of Kansas, we viewed agency attempts to hide information as a strong indication of wrongdoing. We did not ignore when they hid evidence. We tried to investigate further. So the same government that is prosecuting me for entirely peaceful conduct is also trying to prevent me from accessing discovery. Why not be transparent if there is nothing to hide? He says, it is no secret. The government was conducting undercover operations on January 6. Michael Sherwin, who was the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, told this entire world in an interview. He says, does, does the government, well, yeah, he did do that, right? Does the government undercover fed narrative, a wild conspiracy cons created by their own employee? They say, if so, several body-worn cameras produced in this in this discovery show that Mr. Sherwin, the U.S. attorney, was there. They also say Officer Foskett's body camera 
includes a conversation with how to identify persons undercover. We saw that in a prior exhibit, a prior uh, segment. There's also body camera footage showing Brown, Styles, Vanacor responding to reports of uh, men con carrying concealed firearms. They were approached. They showed their DOJ DEA credentials. He says, these are not wild conspiracies. These are facts on video. The only reason I'm able to access these facts and share them as public exhibits is because they are not designated as highly sensitive. However, the government continues to try to block me from having full access to this discovery. The government's concern is that they might reveal illicit behavior themselves. He says, it's my constitutional right to fight these charges without the presence of counsel. I must manage my own case. And he says, I still only have access to less than 1% of the discovery. I need full access in order to sift through them and determine what is relevant. I followed this court's directives. And so I'm asking for the following. I need immediate access to 4.9 million files in the discovery. The court can immediately grant me full access to evidence.com CCTV footage. And so he wants that ordered. Submitted February 17th, the year of our Lord, 2023 by William Pope, pro se officer of the court, he says. And so that's submitted. And it's going to be very interesting to see what the judge does with this, okay? Because the judge has to be extremely careful now because this is a person who's not represented and the judge does not want to accidentally encroach on his constitutional rights. And so if the judge, you know, if there is the potential for a constitutional violation, it would be the judge sort of railroading this, right? Just going right up. Nope. You don't get this. You don't get this. You don't get this. Sorry. Good luck. Trial scheduled next month. I'll see you in court and we'll see how you do. That would create a whole slew of appealable issues. So in this case, right. And the judge doesn't want to do this all again. So let's say that judge denies, 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 this case goes to trial. He could lose, make an appeal. I had a discovery violation. I needed that evidence to make this argument. If the judge is not very careful on that, right? If the judge sort of screwed that portion up, then a court of appeals might turn around and send it back down and ask for a new trial. And so the judge is really, really going to want to avoid, you know, having that happen. But what we're seeing here is more of the arguments of government complicity, government collusion, government incitement, making its way into these filings. And as Tucker gets more of this footage out in front of the American people, these arguments might carry some weight in front of the judges. Of course, we're still talking about DC circuit judges, so we're not going to hold our breath too much, but it's interesting to read this. And it's very interesting to see what William Alexander Pope is doing. So uh, shout outs to William Alexander Pope out there and the people who are supporting him and helping him get through this difficult situation. We're keeping our thoughts out for you. Hopefully this continues to mature nicely for this case, but of course we'll continue to follow it and we'll ask you to subscribe and join us as we do, because there will be a lot more to come from that. Now, William Pope also submitted the flip book. Now I forgot to mention this. This is the flip book that he referenced. He gave us instructions on the flip book itself but then he actually created it. So he took this from the government's files from their video. He went and took a screenshot of this. And here it is all the different screenshots of the video. And you'll notice that he has in red circled somebody. Now, if you actually watch the video, this is what it looks like. Okay, this is the scene on J6. Now they're slowing this video. And what's going on over here? Who is pushing that sign right there? Who was that? Who was that pushing that sign? Oh my goodness. Right there. Yeah, who was that person? Very, very curious, right? 
yeah, a lot of questions about who that individual was. And if you take a look at the flipbook filing, at the ultra zoomed in photo on the first page, oh yeah, it's that guy, huh? Who is that guy? Why does he keep showing up all over the place? Weird. Very strange. Feds literally pushing the stuff <laughs> into the crowd. <laughs> ah, everywhere you turn, it's just feds filling in everywhere you look. So, of course, that's the William Pope case. We'll continue to cover J this case and all of the other J6 cases. And we wish William Pope and everybody who is fighting back against an overly bearing and burdensome government the best as they fight on. Of course, we'll continue to cover it. Thank you for liking this video and subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.